<laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Dan Keane. I'm head chef at Urban Brewing and Stake Restaurant. Um, I'm here today to bring this series of cook-alongs to a close, and what better way to do that than with the most Dublin dish of all, uh, Hoddle. So we're going to start off um, pretty simply by we're going to the last here. Uh, we're going to brown some sausage in the bottom of our uh, saucepan. So these sausages are uh, organic and um, one of the meat, a couple of slices on in. You want to say what you want to that many of the Not nice, let's call them. <clears throat> We're just going to run the sausages a little bit of on the pan and then just take them out. Um, it's just adding a little bit of flavor and um, make them a little bit lighter at the end. We want to make it light and we did it really good for us to have a little bit of flavor. While they're browning, I'm just going to chop a little bit of thyme. Um, this is going to go in later on with the onion. Um, yeah, once the sausages get a nice bit of color on. You want to keep it really fine so you don't get nice, you don't get salty woody bits. So we just get it as fine as possible. Make sure you roll, you turn your sausages to get the nice, nice color all over. I hope you were all ready for, uh, before we started, so we're going quick today. After we brown our sausages, we have a uh, bacon here as well. Um, this bacon we actually made ourselves in the restaurant. We uh, dry cured it ourselves out of a um, free range pork belly. Um, dry cured is a lot better than any of the wet cured, brine pump ones. You just get it, it's actually, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it has less salt in it than the brine pump one because the salt doesn't get injected into it. So it's actually healthier for you. Huh? What? Healthy bacon, bacon. Uh, not exactly healthy bacon, but it's healthier than the uh, healthier than the the brine pump ones, the ones that uh basically contain a little bit of water and salt. So when you cook them, they shrink down by 50%. We'll get a little bit of color in our sausages and then we're gonna take them back out and put them on our plate. Just while we're doing this, I'll give you a little bit of history of coddle that I've been doing a bit of research on. Apparently, coddle was a dish made mostly over leftovers. And the idea was that people got rid of all their meat on a Thursday before the Friday, where you weren't allowed to eat meat for obviously the you know, religious reasons. So that people used all their leftover bacon and, uh, bacon and sausages to make this. Um, the actual origin of the name is French. It means to lightly boil. A bit of background if you want to know. All right, so once we have a little bit of color on the sausage, in goes the bacon, and we're just gonna 
again, just kind of sweat out some of the some of the oils, natural oils, and the bacon. Um, get rid of me, Tom. Yeah, natural oils and the bacon, just getting the flavor up there. I'm just throwing a little bit more oil just to read it through. All of this flavor in the bottom of the pot, all of the like the little bit sticking and all of that, that's all going to come off later on when we add our chicken stock and we sweat our onions. It's just all adding to the flavor. This dish was put forward by um, by Ballycurnock School. Um, and to me, it, it reminds me of my, uh, my childhood, basically. My mother used to make it for me. But like, uh, Coddle is such a strictly Dublin dish that my dad, from, who was, was from Kilkenny, uh, never even heard of it before he actually met my mother. So this isn't an Ireland dish, this is a Dublin dish. This is why we're using it to finish. Is that how you over? I don't know if that's how you want them over. Probably not. Oh, I'm gonna be cool. <laughs> right, so I'm just removing the bacon again then. And then we're gonna put in our sliced onions and we're just gonna lower the temperature down a bit and we're gonna cook them on low. You're just wetting them down. And the whole idea is you're kind of lifting all of the, the, the remains of the sausages and the bacon with the onion. So you just cook them down and cook them through. And then with the onion, I'm gonna add in this thyme we chop. So what you're basically wanting, you're wanting the, uh, the onion just to go a bit translucent, start to sweeten up. If, you, if you're starting to brown onion, you have to, it's too hot. So you're gonna to need to just lower the temperature down a bit. I get into my pot. Oh, yeah, I'm trying to get closer. Uh, Sabrina, did you get the sugar? I did get sugar. Because I wouldn't mind just knocking that out now. Sabrina's lost sugar. Don't worry, she'll find it. Where's the ball? Thank you very much. And I'm just going to obviously get Okay, the just there. seeing as this coddle is just a one, one pot dish and uh, I didn't want to just be standing here stirring a pot for the whole time. I, I actually went out on a walk this morning and collected some stuff that I thought you guys might be interested in. So what I did was, hold on, I need to try and turn this on. What I did was I went, out and, I went out and walked my dog this morning and I collected some wild food that I wrote a blog about that's on the website. Um, I'm going to start off with a very, very obvious one, which is this one. It's a uh, elderflower. This is like everywhere. This is all over the city. Like you, you can name, you go any park, like any suburb really in, in, in the entire of the county of Dublin and you'll see this growing everywhere. Really, really nice smell, very floral. Um, that, it adds a touch of sweetness in itself, but it comes out really strongly if you add a little bit of sugar into it as well when you're making a syrup. This one is uh, called meadow sweet. It is a, a little flower, somewhat similar to the elder flower. This actually has a lot more references in history. This is also known as mugwort, if you're a Viking. And it's what they used to use to flavor their mead back about a thousand years ago. So this one has really a lot of history and particularly a lot of history in Dublin as well with its relation to the Vikings. And the last one, which is the one Sabrina is most excited about because I talked to her about it last week, is a little weed and it, it grows like a fence post and beating down tracks and stuff like that. And it's, um, it's actually called pineapple weed and it's called pineapple weed for a reason, because if you boil it in a little bit of a sugar syrup, it completely tastes and smells of pineapple. So I'm just gonna show you guys here. So I've got some water boiling there. I'm just gonna add some sugar to it. Not a huge amount. And then once the sugar melts, I'm gonna put the pineapple weed in it and it will, um, it will just, I'm afraid you guys won't get the smell, but, um, People here with and uh, you just have to take their word for it and my word for it. 
Okay, so our onions are getting kind of soft now. They're getting a really nice kind of lightly golden color. They're lifting the things off the bottom. All right, this is where we're going to put our bacon and our sausages back in. Okay. And then that goes into the bottom. Once the bacon and sausages are back in, this is where we're going to add our chicken stock. So I wasn't expecting you guys to make your own chicken stock. What you could do is, what you can do is just use a, you know, either liquid pods and then a liter of water or like it's oxo cube, chicken oxo cube and then a liter of water. Um, so we just add that in then. I'm just gonna crank this up a little bit just so we get a boil going or a light simmer. All right, so once the stock is in, um, we just let that, before it heats up too much, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to put our turnips in because these take about half an hour to cook and we don't want to be early. So nice little dice turnip, about a centimeter dice. In that goes. Traditionally, coddle is made with whatever we add in the fridge or not fridges in the case maybe whatever we had in the pantry um so whatever vegetables you have or had at home or the or people back in the day had at home they used to just they used to just throw it in the pot it's kind of the same idea as the traditional irish stew as well it's just a real hearty meal to fill out just to fill you up um we weren't uh we weren't the most well off people back in the day so most of our food was boiled because most of our meat was tough um Okay, so now my water, my syrup water is boiling, so I'm just going to turn that off. Then I'm going to take my little bit of pineapple wheat, and I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see that from there, but maybe we'll stick a picture up somewhere. Um, so just go see, so you guys can see what it looks like. It's literally just like little, tiny little um, yellow bulbs on the top of a little, of a little weed. Yeah, good. Right. So we're just going to add that into the syrup. And... I to be honest, normally I'd have a lot more than just that little bit, but let's see how we go. You can already get the smell coming out of that. It's already pineapple-y and, and the face is just really nice. Um, we, we import a huge amount of food in this country. We import food from all over the world. Like we get asparagus in Peru, we get like peppers and tomatoes from Holland. Um, and we have things that grow all around us that we don't use. So the whole idea with something like this is, say if you're making a dessert, say you want to make a panna cotta, you're, you're, you're doing a brulee, for instance. Like in work at the moment, I have a rose brulee on my menu and it's made with rose petals that, we, that are from Ireland. And that's what we use for flavor, you know? Um, like, so with this, instead of using pineapple in something, say you were making, as I said, a panna cotta or a brulee or cheesecake, you could get this, make this syrup, make it really strong and add that in instead. And instead of having a vanilla cheesecake, which comes from Madagascar or somewhere else, you could have a pineapple wheat cheesecake, which comes from here. So there's no carbon footprint because you go and collect it yourself. There's no feeling guilty about it. It's just real nice, easy, and real handy food to use. And if you, you know, smell of that now. I can smell it from here. Smell yeah, yeah, no, I can smell it from like a meter away. Right? Yeah, it smells like pineapple. It smells like pineapple. And it, it's just, know. it's a perfectly acceptable substitute for things that we don't need to bring in from overseas. Uh, like the same with the meadow sweet, the same with elderflower. Like we used to collect these things years ago. As I said, the, um, the Vikings used meadow sweets for making mead and flavor, adding flavor to that. If you don't know what meat is, kids, ask your parents. You want to tell us what meat is? Well, meat, is an alcohol, meat is an alcoholic drink made from honey. And I'm going to add the carrots into the pot now as well, okay? Um, so they used to use that to add extra depth and flavor to the honey, uh, to the meat, um, just to give it a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more depth, a little bit more flavor. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're us professional chefs, I think, are becoming more and more open to um, bringing these things back, bringing um, yeah, bringing these things back, bringing local food back to the fore. Because for the last twenty years, all we have is uh, food coming in from everywhere else, and 
we want to promote local producers we want to promote local food wild foods um like in dublin in particular markets are a huge are a very good source of places to buy organic and fresh vegetables and if you have never been to one go to one because they are actually a, a hell of a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun actually talking to the people that grow them. Um, so if you can start that conversation with someone and where your food comes from, you have more understanding of what goes into your food. And the more you understand about what goes into your food, the more you're going to enjoy your food. Are, are there markets in Dublin that, like, in particular that you recommend that they come to mind? Um, there's one in Herbert Park, isn't there? And there's another one. Where's the other one you're talking, we were talking about today? So we have this today. Yeah, it's more of a journey day kind of thing. So you have St. Anne's Park, Herbert Park. There, there's actually, are they all on the website? They're all on the website. They're inside the website. Okay, they're, they're, they're all on the website. You guys look, you'll have opening times, um, days, whatnot. And like, as I said, it's where you're going to meet your local producers and stuff. Like, I'm lucky, whereas I'm, I work in a business where I have people coming to me trying to sell me things, whereas you guys have to go look for us. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to add in my leaks. Again, we're, we're trying to keep all the vegetables, ones that have, are historically grown here. Like North Dublin, there's a lot of fields um, that still grow vegetables. You know, like there's not as much in the city centre anymore, but we're trying we're, we're trying to get some planted um okay so this is just going to simmer now guys for uh, put the potatoes in i suppose and then we're going to have to talk about stuff for the next half an hour um yeah i'm just gonna add in some potatoes guys and as i said this is just a one pot dish this is how people cooks or used to cook that um back in the day we used to just make one big pot of food for everybody you have to eat while you're given. <laughs> that was the same when I was young. You got given a plate of food and you weren't going to leave the table until you finished. Um, okay, so everything's in. Okay, so we have turnips, carrots, leeks, potatoes, onions, a bit of thyme in there, a bit of chicken stock, really good sausages, really good bacon. And then we're just going to leave that simmer. And as I said, this is actually what the word means. Coddle means to simmer something or boil something gently. So that's that's what we're doing, right? And I'm going to get this one now. So what we are doing is we're just going to finish this off today with a little bit of uh, just finely chopped uh, valley parsley. So just for sure, watch your fingers. I don't have to look, but you do. <laughs> Moving the flowers for the action shot. I'm just up there. <laughs> all in the knife face. It's all in the knife. You want it relatively finely chopped. Try to keep it in a. Uh, you know what I'll do. I'll tell you how to do it. i show you to do it in college. All right. So you got your two fingers and your tongue. You put two fingers and your thumb on the end of your blade. Then you grab the end of it like that, okay? And then you just rock it back and forth. Over the top. Like. You don't do it, nothing like this. <laughs> no, you're not gonna get anything done, all right? And try not to be as messy as I'm being. Not likely simmering anymore. We're not cuddling. <laughs> Me, um, I, this is a kind of really weird story. I, from when I was very young, used to say I wanted to be a chef to my granny. She used to ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up. Um, and I used to always say I want to be a chef. 
Right? And then I completely forgot about it from about the age of 11 or 12 till I was about 15. And I used to say I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. So then I um, just look at it till I ended up getting a job in a kitchen as a kitchen porter when I was 15, back when you were out work when you were younger. Um, and uh, I ended up uh, sticking in it ever since. So I'm 22 years in kitchens now to this day. And to be honest, I don't think I could do anything else. Um, I love my job. I love what I do for a living. Um, and it's brought me all the way around the world and back again. So like, it's, it's all just experiences really, you know, no matter where you are in the world, everybody needs to eat. Everybody has different cultures. Like you learn about people by what they eat, by how they eat. Like traditionally in Ireland, we all sit down, but well, we used to sit down and take individual bowls out of a big pot. But you go to somewhere like Thailand or the Middle East and they just sit around a table with a lot of bowls in the middle of the table and it's all hands in and they just sit around and share that way. Then like you have what we do and work as well with the tapas, which is designed to share. And it's, it's a way of bringing people together. And like, I think as a culture, we are growing when it comes to food. Food, like as an Irish people, we're not as regimented as we used to be. We used to be, you have to have this and this and this, and you have to have a dinner at three o'clock and you have to, you know, it has to be, have potatoes on it. And I know I'm making a coddle here, guys, but like. Potatoes <laughs> <laughs> um, are delicious. Yeah, and potatoes are delicious. But like, we, we're, as a food culture, as a food, food nation, we're evolving a lot quicker than we are in, in, in other ways. And, it, and it's, it's, it's to our benefit. You know, if, 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 you, if you're learning about other cultures or like, say they, were make, they made a Thai curry last week. Like, that is something, if we had done this 20 years ago, it never would have been a Thai curry or a fajita. Mm. It would have been, um, I don't know, baked ham or stuff like that. Whereas now, like, again, I know I'm making a call, but I figured it didn't, why not finish off with the most Dublin thing I could think of. That's kind um, of the exception to prove the point though. Yeah, it is. Like, like this, all the ideas for the food for this whole series came from kids in Dublin. And we got fajitas, we got Thai curries, we got, they made baba ganoush and hummus and stuff yesterday. I know that was a little bit more of a sidetrack, but it, it just shows that the diversity that we're, we're getting now, you know, like, as I said, when I was younger, because obviously the recipes have come from grandparents and parents, my granny would have probably been like, uh, let's do, I, I don't know, maybe a shepherd's pie or a stew or a, a, a like, and my, my granny who's not from Dublin would have been even more, just a big mound of mashed potatoes and some meat, you know what I mean? So the fact that we're growing this way is, 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 it, is it, it's good. Like it's, it's kind of like reverse, reverse immigration. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like people are going off all over the world and coming back with great ideas. Like chefs don't stay in Ireland anymore. We go and we come back and like, or you have great chefs coming here to show us what they do or what they can do, what their cultures are. Like there's a couple of really, really good Indian restaurants in Dublin now that weren't there 20 years ago, you know, but they're really good and they do really, really good food. Someone was talking to me the other day about a Nigerian restaurant. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know about it, but apparently it's amazing, you know? So all of this stuff is is opening up and it's broadening our horizons and it, it's broadening our spice palettes. Let's put it that way, because Irish people, there's a story about a friend of my brother's who moved to Canada when he was 26 and he'd never eaten rice before. <laughs> uh, and he was 26 and he'd never eaten rice before. Right? Um, but that doesn't happen now. But I shouldn't have. I don't think. Vancouver's the sushi capital of Asia. I know. I've not moved to Vancouver and I've never eaten rice before he got there. I mean, but like, that's that's a rarity now, whereas back 30, 40 years ago, it wouldn't. Oh, so, that's my two cents on it. What was the first dish you cooked? Oh, really? Yeah, we're generally all curious. First dish I ever cooked? Jeez, I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. Thank you want 37. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like honestly, I, uh, first dish, one of the first dishes I was ever really proud of, of I can do that one. I, I, I was head chef in a tapas restaurant in Sydney and 
it was relatively traditional tapas, all kind of Spanish style. But I had a conversation with my boss, the owner, and, and she was like, I'd like to branch out a little bit, not do um not do just traditional Spanish stuff. Right? We used to do tortillas and and like stuff like that. So I had an idea of doing three little Wellingtons. So I did a beef Wellington, a lamb Wellington, and a venison Wellington, each with their own little puree. I can't even remember what they were now, apart from 10 years ago. Um, and it was just completely out of what they do. And then I followed that up with some um, something really random, which was fish and chips, but as a tapa with homemade ketchup. So I made like little little fish fillets, little fish fingers, and then I made, I don't know if you guys know what pond of potatoes are. No, no. Pond of potatoes are, they're like little batons of potatoes. Right? Um, so if I square this off, right? a pond of potato is basically that, but it's about that long. Okay. And then you triple cook it. So you, um, oh yeah, so is, you, it, is it sometimes called triple cooked fries? Well, there's triple cooked fries, but pond loaf are different because they have to be a specific shape, and they're supposed to be stacked in nines, which is why they're called pond loaf. Oh, so you do tree and tree and tree. Right. So we we triple cook them. So triple cooking a potato. We're getting really off topic here, but anyway. <laughs> um, let's put potatoes. Yeah, yeah. Triple cooked potatoes are you basically steam them or boil them first? And normally, if you're boiling them, you boil them for it's boiling for four minutes. And then you take them out and you just leave them steam somewhere until they go a little bit fluffy on the outside. Mm -hmm. Then you fry them at 160 degrees and then you let them cool again. And then you fry them again at 180 degrees. And the whole point of this is you get a double layer of crunch on the inside and then you have a flowery center. All right, so I made basically little fish and chips and then a little stack of nine potatoes with homemade ketchup. So from going from really traditional Spanish, we opened up a whole new way of doing things in this little restaurant. And it was, it was just, it was a really good experience for me, like get, get, because you're not stuck in a pigeonhole. When you get stuck in a pigeonhole, you just end up repeating the same things. So that's actually why this is really good for people because they're going to, they're seeing how to make different stuff um, or traditional stuff. Um, so like if you, once you get yourself out of your comfort zone, you're, you're, you're experiencing new things. It might not always be good. God knows it's not always good. <laughs> um, but sometimes it, it is really, really good. Like that does beg a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, like the best meal I, I've ever eaten, and to this day, I've eaten in some of the top fifty restaurants in the world and stuff like that. But the best meal I've ever eaten was in a little restaurant in a place in Vietnam called Mune, and it was called the restaurant was called Bamboo Bamboo, and it was a duck and pineapple curry, and it was sensational. It was so good. I went back for lunch and dinner the next day. <laughs> like seriously, I brought everybody back with me. I was like, this is amazing. And it was just like a little bowl of this with thing and a little bowl of rice. And it was absolutely stunning. Um, so like great food is just out there to find. Like it's part of the foraging as well. Like you just go out and find it. Um, read the blog, by the way. I put it in chat for people. Um, yeah, because this is a this is a thing like people think nothing grows around Dublin or nothing, nothing edible grows around Dublin, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Like I know the wild garlic season has probably just ended, but there was wild garlic all over Phoenix Park. You know, you can take the skates before the flowers bloom and pickle them and add them to salads. You can make pesto from the leaves themselves. You can ferment the leaves. You can do all of these things. To it. Um, people who don't know what fermenting is, it's adding salt and basically leaving it in a controlled rot for a while until it produces its own acid, which preserves itself. Um, so like all of this stuff is like all of this food in this pot is, is all relatively local. It's all Irish. Like we made the bacon ourselves. Making bacon is pretty, is, is actually a lot easier than you would think. A little bit time consuming, but actually quite easy. Um, it's just, a, you, make a, you make a cure. So it's basically equal parts sugar and salt is what we did. Uh, no, nah, 40% sugar, 60% salt. Um, and then add a couple of spices to that. Like say you have pink peppercorns or whatever basically you want to add to it. And I will add that flavor in. Some, sometimes you can you can add a bit of treacle or a golden syrup or honey and you sweet cure it. Um, like it's just buying good pork, buying good meat. I know this the focus on this has been all on vegetables so far. 
every dish we've done so far has been vegetables and vegetarian. And that's that that's really cool because we are trying to promote plant-based eating, but we also need to promote um sustainable meat eating as well. So you need to be very aware of where your meat is coming from. Like, are you buying free-range chicken? Are you buying free-range eggs? Are you is the pork in your sausages from a factory farm? Is is your meat coming from a board via approved supplier? You know, this is these are all things that thankfully actually in this country a lot of it is taken care of by the EU regulations, by the government, by everything else. But it, it's just it's an interesting topic to get into to see where your stuff comes from. The food, the food that your food eats is what's really important in this because I've there's been a lot of stuff recently about soybeans being shipped from Brazil to Europe to feed chickens and cows and, and stuff. And that's all negatively affecting the carbon footprint of the food you eat. And we are very lucky in this country that we have farmers that have really nice fields with really nice grass and, um, and things like that, because we don't need to import a huge amount of feed. We don't, we don't have a huge amount of that. So most of our food is, most of our meat and stuff is, it is free range. It is outside. It is free of from all those added nastiness. And um, yeah, we're lucky. But it just it's 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 no harm just looking into it for yourselves anyway. Like again, it's where this is all to promote sustainability and healthy eating. Like, and that's that's where that comes from. Basically. Yeah, I think it's something people take for granted here as well. That yeah, it, it is. It is free range, and you go to other countries and you realize that like the restaurant doesn't tell you where it comes from because they don't no. want you to know. But no, here, exactly. it doesn't matter where you put. They're proud to put this is our supplier. This yeah, like, there's I, nothing to buy. I I can get chicken fillets at work for ninety cents a chicken breast, right? That's that's how much a chicken breast costs. If you want to buy just a random chicken breast, they're ninety cents each for me. But for you guys, they're probably about one twenty, one ten each. For the cheapest ones, you know, for the cheapest ones. But if you're willing to pay that a little bit more, like so, uh, free range chicken for me and work uh, supreme with the bone and everything still attached, or even a whole chicken, is about four fifty five euro. I can get a whole non free range chicken for two fifty three euro. So it's about an extra. It's a premium of about twenty five to thirty percent on what you buy. But the flavor is worth it. The fact that you don't have guilt about where the chicken came from is worth it. Um, and it's it, they're just better. They're better for you. They're better, like, they're healthier animals because they're looked after better, you know? And if you're eating healthier animals, there's nothing but better health benefits for you, you know? Michelle did pop a question on her, asking um, if you explain the difference between... No, I didn't. Uh, where brown and white cuddle. Brown and white cuddle. Well, I suppose if we were going to make it brown, brown cuddle would be by using a beef stock, I would imagine, and cook down a little bit more. To be perfectly honest, I was not aware that there were two types of cuddle. Cuddle is a thing with no recipe. It's just what people had left over. So if I imagine if I was making a brown cuddle, what I would have used was a beef stock or a brown beef stock, as it's known as opposed to a white beef stock. So a brown beef stock is you basically roast the bones before you boil them and then you boil them for about 18 hours. Yeah, it takes that long. And then you, you drain it off and then you reduce it down and you empty. It's basically what gravy is made out of. So anytime you go to a restaurant and there's jus on the menu, that's how they make it. Um, we're getting there, lads, we're getting there. Um, it is more of a common thing with a lot of things. Uh, Just, is there a kind probably of my sister. <laughs> Possibly. They're not revealing themselves. Anyway. Um, interesting to wonder if people know what the price of what we buy are plus. I think people in a lot of places expect cheapness without my philosophy itself. Yeah, well, we have a thing. Basically, I have a kind of a philosophy in work, and it's to find the cheapest I can. But because we have to, obviously, because we're a business, we have to make money. But it's the best, cheapest, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like you don't necessarily go for the cheapest thing you can buy, because in the long run, it's gonna it's gonna cost you. So, like if you you if you're trying to ensure a particular amount of quality, you have to get the best you can at the cheapest price, which is the best, cheapest, if you get me. Yeah. Whereas if you just go for the cheapest, you're left with like. 
perfect example is bacon in here. Okay, so we made that bacon good. Like you, you can get really, really good dry cured bacon in this country. They do really, really nice stuff. But then you can get the stuff that you get in most supermarkets and you throw it into a pan and you cook it and it goes in this size and it comes out this size. That's because it's full of water. They pump brine into it. Brine, in, in case you don't know, is salt and water basically mixed together and they stick a big syringe into it and they inject it so that the, the piece of ham or bacon that they're cutting actually swells and then they slice it. So then when you're cooking it, all it does is come out into the pan and that's where you get, so, so you have a pan here. So that's where you get your like white residue, salt residue sitting all over the pan. That's what that's from. Whereas if you get a dry cure bacon, you don't, you don't, you still get a little bit of residue, but it's, they don't, there's no added, added water. So with the brine pumps, the, the, they add the water because it increases the weight and it increases the weight, increases the yield, which increases the amount of money that they're making. If you dry cure something, you lose weight. So you're going to lose 15 to 20% of your weight because you're, you're pulling the water out of it, but you get a better product. So that's, that's basically what it is. It's, it's companies increasing their yields and you getting a worse quality product or companies actually caring about what they're selling you and giving you a good product. You know? Like putting a small gift in a really big box. Exactly. Yeah. We have a question about potatoes. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I, I wrote a 3,000 word assignment on potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going on the website? No, uh, so <laughs> I don't have it anymore. You can add that to the website. Uh, earlier, you were talking about floury potatoes. We have trouble finding any recommendations. <laughs> yeah, but like that's the thing. There's so many different types of potatoes. It really just depends on the time of year. I have roosters in here at the moment. Um, and I personally use them. So if I'm making mashed potato and work or anything or mashed potatoes at home, I personally use roosters most of the time. But I don't use them in the way you guys use them. I don't boil them in water. I bake them in their skins and then cook the, cook the potatoes in half and then scoop out the inside and use that to make the mash. And it gives you a, a more intense flavor and um, a, a, a lighter feel for your mash because you're not carrying all the water. Um, so like flowery potatoes, you, like this rooster, there's, there's basically two types, there's waxy and flowery. Right? So like, and to be honest with you, most of the bags that you see on now in supermarkets are, will tell you what the potatoes are for. You know, so you can see like, you pick up a thing of Maris Pipers and it'll tell you that it's good for mashed potato. Don't believe it, they're actually not. It's better for roast potatoes. But roosters are really good for mashed potato, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So like, if you're looking for a really good potato for mash, it's roosters. If you're looking for a really good potato for roast potatoes, uh, Maris Pipers are a really good potato for roast potatoes. And then like, if you're going into jacket potatoes and skins, just try and get the newest, freshest potatoes you can. So like anytime your new, new potato season comes around. I know my mother, every time new potatoes come around, she comes out, she's just got like a bag of them, she's like telling me that she has these new potatoes. Have you tried these potatoes yet? And my wife's mother is exactly the same. She came back from Wexford a couple of weeks ago with a bag of potatoes. Have you tried them yet? Two, day, two days later, have you tried them potatoes? <laughs> <laughs> then, what, do, what do you do with the skins? You said when you scoop it out, what do you do with the um, skins? Generally, in work, what we do with the skins is we stuff them and give them staff. All right. So, Staff food, so we like make potato skins, so we might fill them with cheese sauce yeah. and bacon and roast them in the oven and then give them to the staff. Yeah, hey, it's <laughs> a that's such a common thing in America. It's called potato skins. Oh, potato it's skins. always on the menu, and I always wonder why I never see it here. I thought maybe the skins are being used somewhere else. Uh, I worked for an American guy in New Zealand. I know that sounds really weird, but I worked for an American guy in New Zealand. His name was Ed. He was quintessentially American. That's the best way I can put it. Um, but he had this thing about twice baked potatoes. Um, and we had arguments with him about putting it on the menu to the point where he actually brought some in from home and gave us a tray of them and went, it's here, try these. And we did, and we were like, yeah, we're not putting them on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> so, but like, that was because for him, what he liked was garlic powder, onion powder, like what we would consider fake flavors. Whereas I, I would like, I really like Say for new fried chicken, garlic powder, onion powder, or whatever, it would, would work really well. But in a potato, to me, it doesn't work. I would rather just use onions and garlic. You know, so if I was doing it, I'd have onions and garlic and spread them off on potatoes and then nice cheese sauce on the top. We, we have a really nice roast cauliflower and work at the moment. And we make a, you, you, I don't think you've had that. You haven't had it. Um, 
and we make a what is known as a best now. Um, but we use manchego cheese, and then we spice it with Middle Eastern spices. So you basically get like a really creamy cheese sauce with a hint of like a Moroccan tagine, and then we have a lot of roast cauliflower on that. So the way we tend to, well, us chefs, I hopefully my most of our look at food is that we want the real flavors to come true. We don't want to add the fake. But I personally agree, which I think potato skins are delicious if they come correct. Yeah, <laughs> but the thing is, like, it doesn't go to waste. Stuff. Like, you don't. No. Yeah, we don't. We don't waste. We we do our very best not to waste anything. Like obviously we're gonna we're gonna waste some things, but like say we're peeling carrots, that goes into the stock peelings. Like um again, the, we were peeling an onion, we're taking out, we want to center, the rest of that goes into the stock. Where say for prepping whole chickens, the chicken carcass goes into the stock. Or like that's the thing, or for say we got a whole beef rump in, there's a top on the bit, there's a top of it, and it's called a, in Brazil they call it a picanha. Oh yeah. And the picanha is the Brazilian's favorite bit of meat on the entire animal. It's the rump cap here. But if you if you if you trim off the there's a there's a little kind of elbow on it, and if you trim off the little elbow, which it tends to be really tough, and you you cook that, you get left with um a really really nicely cooked tender piece of meat, and it's really really good. And they cover it, they cake it in salt, and roast it, and it's delicious. But we don't do that here. But that's something that we do in work from time to time because we have a lot of resilience and because it's delicious and it's. I would say it's free, but it's not. We're paying for it, but it's an offcut of something that we use, you know. So generally, that's what we try to do. Um, because uh, you're at the computer. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, uh, yay! What is the most Interesting thing you've eaten on your travels. Oh, that is definitely either my wife or my sister. <laughs> no, 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 nobody sent that question in. Oh, that's for you. Oh, um, I have indulged in insects occasionally. I've eaten crickets and little fried maggoty things. Yeah. They don't actually taste bad. They just taste like the oil that they're cooked in. But the most, the weirdest thing I've ever eaten was I was in a, I was in a food tour in Vietnam. I was in Hanoi and we were laughing and joking and we've been to a couple of beer places and whatnot. And then we were like, what's the weirdest thing we can have? And she stops with this guy on the side of the street who literally has a bucket and we're boiling water in it. So it's obviously some sort of fire underneath. And he gives me what looks like a hard boiled egg. So uh, you're covering your mouth now, look. Yeah, right? <laughs> so I open the egg and there's a fully formed little chicken inside the egg. Um, it's called Balut. It's uh, from Vietnam, Philippines, that kind of area of the world. So they the fertilized chicken egg and then they cook it, but you can get it at different weeks. So there's like a six week one or four week one or whatever. And the, the, the longer it is, the bigger the bird is. Um, and I ate it and it doesn't actually taste that bad. It's more visual and textural because there's a bit of crunch involved. You know, like there is a beacon feet in there, you know. So that's probably the weirdest thing. Also, when you do travel, I'm just going to add this, when you do travel, eat what the local people eat, because I've learned that to my cost. I traveled with two people um, who weren't as adventurous as my friend and I, we went, who, who traveled with us as well. And we made the mistake of ordering a BLT in a bar in Thailand. And um, the next two days were very unpleasant. So if you actually see where the local people are eating and eat what they eat, you generally tend to be fine. You don't have that problem anymore. And it, it's also probably a lot better than what you can get in, instead of their approximation of what we eat. You know? Yeah, definitely. Oh, we're nearly there, right? Um, have we got screen anyway? Uh, gonna have to correct the seasoning. I'm, I'm probably gonna need a ladle as well if there's one in there. Uh, there is a question. Are there butchers around town that cater for rare cuts of meat? Well, most butchers, if you, thank you, most butchers, if you go into them, can order something for you. I tried to get a brisket um, last year and I went into the butcher near where I live um, and he said, we don't carry it, but what I can do is I'll order it in for you. So depending on what, what it is, 
the thing is um rarer or more like obscure cuts of meat are tend a lot of the time are tend to be used in restaurants now because they're cheaper and we can't afford to use the really high-end cuts all the time so like beef cheeks or or um feather blades or like we use all of those and when i first started in kitchens you used to be able to buy beef cheeks for one euro each and now they're eight euros a kilo seven idea. euros a kilo because everybody wants every restaurant that they want yeah. feather blades are the same they used to be about three four quid a kilo now they're seven or eight quid a kilo and it's it's all down to basically people just wanting to use it so i'm just going to taste this good everything goes through phases so like even like you know lobsters lobsters and crabs are expensive now but that used to be fishermen would throw them back because no one wanted them you know not need hungry oh yeah um we get lobsters at work at the moment i put a lobster tap on um just to uh for a bit of variety and they're bang in season now so they're really really good and we get i don't know if any of you guys have actually seen native irish lobsters they're bright blue when they come out of the water they're awesome looking they're speckly and they're blue obviously you cook them and they cook pink, but they're blue when they come out of the water they're a really amazing shade of blue um so we get them at the moment but like there's a if they're in season but there's a shortage you know what i mean it's it's really it's really strange they're in season but there's a shortage of um lobsters at the moment i don't know if it's title or whatever Are they changed? but maybe and we're paying an absolute arm and a leg for the ones that we're we're using but we get them from um a company called lambay crab and thing and like so our lobsters are literally caught like 10 15 kilometers from where our restaurant is and then they're shipped to us so they're like they're lifted and then we have them either that day or the next day like so i'm not saying anybody out there is going to run out and buy some lobsters or anything but it's it's a really good thing of buying local and getting the best you possibly can and then having it really really soon right i'm gonna turn this off this because i think we're there What's the disconnect for people? Like, I think the thing is being non Irish here, you can have amazing seafood, but why is it not celebrated enough? I, I honestly think that there was a there was a kind of disconnect back about 100 years ago where the poor people ate fish and the rich people ate meat. And it was seen as a poor person's diet. And now what we have is fish is actually quite expensive. Um, but it's now kind of flipped around that but like people don't generally tend to cook there's a there's a there's a disconnect with fish particularly because people think when they cook it it's going to stink their house out but if it's actually really fresh it doesn't smell it smells like the yeah. sea before you my mom was talking to this ginger but this because ginger is just going to stink your house anyway <laughs> That's a lovely purpose. Yeah. Lovely it's, scent of ginger. It's funny about the quality though, because I, I was in London a couple of years ago and I went to Harrods and they were selling right to Pope. That was the fish they were selling there. Yeah, like, you know? So they're vouching for the quality. Do you know there's something really, really weird and kind of wrong about the way we fish as well here? Right? It's because if you watch the trawler maps, right, we get fish, we get trawlers that come all the way from Japan and fish off our northern coast for uh, tuna for Atlantic bluefin tuna, and we're not allowed to catch them. But they're allowed to come all the way around the world, catch them, freeze them, and bring them back. But if if we catch them, we're not allowed. You're not allowed. There's a really, really, really strict quota of what you're allowed to catch, and we're not allowed to catch them, but they can come over here and catch whatever they want and bring them home. So it's not promoting sustainability. It's just actually stopping us from being able to farm our waters, basically, um, which is, I think is a, is a shame because it, uh, the tuna actually off the north coast of Ireland is some of the best in the world. That's the reason why the Japanese come get it. Like we have some of the best fisheries in the world. And I would love to see people eat more fish, but not only more fish, but different fish. Like have a ling instead of a cod, you know? Like stuff that's avail readily available around here. Skate wings, stuff like that, that isn't causing harm and it's not overly um, overfished, you know? Like cod was in a really bad way, but it's starting to come back up. They're actually saying it's sustainable again, but it's good to go, you know? And then like, but there's a lot of other fish you can use. Like they're actually a lot cheaper. Blossom, Pollock, as I said, Ling already, they're all very similar to cod and they're about half the price, you know? But we can't put them on menus because nobody knows what they are. And then nobody orders them, you know? That's the problem. Or eels, we should all eat eels.
Right, I'm going to add the chopper asking guys just to finish this off. And I'll stop talking, I promise. It's just like, it's like going back in time. Seasoning was the thing I was doing, Seasoning wasn't it? Thing you were doing, yeah. Seasoning and chopping it was my mind. To be honest, I think this was easier than the last one because it's just you guys asking questions as opposed to. Uh... Yeah. yeah. Four hours to do something that takes a half an hour. Next year we can do this kind of live to the audience. Oh, yay. <laughs> questions from the back, please. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm just cracking a bit of black pepper and some sea salt in here. Just, that's another thing, actually. Salt. West coast of Ireland, um, Ackle Island, there's some salt places out there. It's brilliant. And we don't do a lot of... And we used to grow a lot of sugar beets and stuff in Ireland as well, but we don't do that anymore, right? It's true. All, all the salt is always British. Yeah, all the salt is British. All the sugar is normally British as well. We don't, we don't have our own anymore, really. Which is a shame, because it's... it's it's another thing about sustainability. We're talking about monocultures and people growing the same plants and the same plants and the same plants because they make money on them. Another thing I'm, I'm really interested in is rewilding. And um, I actually asked that um, DCC does have the archives of rewild reptiles. So yeah. So that's the answer to that question. Yeah. 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 Yeah
like the the streets that are named after food you know like that's how yeah. we used to name things yeah. like even the strawberry beds out by out by the liffy there that's called that because they used to grow strawberries there you know it's 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 mad when you think about it and now all we have is the m50 <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna label some of these out, guys. Right? So just because we're just talking now, or we're, we're done. So as as like proper good old Irish food, what it should look like is exactly what it sounds like. Right, sausages, bacon, vegetables, all in a nice little clear broth with some herbs floating in it. Is it possible to tilt it a little towards the? Uh, we'll try. It's liquid. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, you can see it. Um, and I have a big puffle, so you guys better be hungry. No trouble. Yeah, no, I made sure. Two milliliters and a veggie, huh? Yeah. Are you missing on this one? I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, nobody has any more questions. Get in quick. Yeah. Are we going to stop? Get in quick. So. I guess from Eaton Streets. Thank you for everybody for attending the festival. Everything will be online and available for you to view again. And we're going to disappear and eat. Yeah, thank you. And have a lot of Jacob. Bye bye.